Eric, the episodes are not our children. In fact, I feel comfortable saying some are our stepchildren. We don't have to play favorites. In fact, we can openly discriminate against certain, well, not discriminate. We could just merely elevate to the exclusion of others certain episodes. And I could say, personally, maybe it's because we haven't had an episode delving into the history of what we love, lifting culture. It feels so damn good, man, to do this again. I like how we're just jumping right into the controversy head first here with this episode. God, do it. In the first 10 seconds of this episode, <laughs> Omar just said openly discriminate uh, and insinuated that he hates some of his children. Yep. Let me just be the, uh, the Jedi to your Sith right now Thanks. and say, I love this episode. <laughs> I felt like we got to return to the roots of iron culture. Uh, and I think if you listen, dear listener, who is listening with your ears, you're going to find that you're going to return to a culture and a history that you may not even be aware existed, but be surprised by how many parallels there are with modern times. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I'm saying is that we only have so much food around here because as we learned, there was indeed a famine. And if we mm -hmm. have a finite, um, it, this is a zero sum game. It's kind of like the society we live in, right? We want to maximize personal wealth. Um, and so if we have a, a finite amount of resources, Eric, and we have to distribute it amongst a certain select amount of individuals, our children, someone's going to go starving. That's all I'm saying. So in, in this instance, it just feel, I feel spiritually fulfilled. I feel like I had my fill of something that once again was missing. And it's incredible having Dr. Connor Heffernan on to talk about physical culture because you see the parallels. Like if we said this towards the end, if you removed the timestamps and some, of, let's say you replace some of the movements that would be now archaic with modern movements, a lot of what Connor was talking about, entirely relevant to today. Absolutely. Yeah, we learn, we learn the historical context of really what are the things that we've been talking about are in culture in non-historical episodes, you know? So, uh, yeah, like Omar said, it's a zero-sum game, folks. Uh, if, if I just did chest day and I eat a bunch of potatoes, that means someone else is getting less, less chest pump. I'm getting that glycogen replenishment. I'm going to be filling out that, 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 that stringer. Someone else looking small, mm -hmm. not getting the girls, as we will find is a, is a constant message in history. Yeah. So while we have this tongue-in-cheek intro, honestly, everything we're saying right now is rooted in something that has a historical uh, component to it. And we see how these threads are carried through into the way that sometimes we either consciously or subconsciously play out our physical culture journeys today. So yeah, I can't say how overjoyed I was at just how well this episode went. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Connor Heffernan. Um, unlike most of the doctors we have on Iron Culture, he is not a doctor of nutritional science, exercise science, strength conditioning, uh, or a DPT or an MD or all of the, the real doctorates that are out there. Um, he is, like me, also a fake doctor, but a fake doctor of a much cooler topic than strength conditioning. Actually, he's a historian, and he is at uh, Austin, a University of, uh, of Austin at Texas, and I think I said that backwards as I almost always do, but he is at the Stark Center, uh, where the, that is honestly, truly the, like, the mecca of physical culture and Iron Game history. Uh, so the Stark Center is a fantastic place. We've talked about it before. Uh, it's, it's the creation of, of Jan, Dr. Jan Todd and the late Dr. Terry Todd. And it's the, basically the, the collation of all of the history of lifting weights going back hundreds of years now. Uh, and it's just a really cool place. So this, this man is literally a strength historian. Uh, and we are so honored to have him on to talk about all these topics. If you're new to the cult, because th this is crazy, Eric, um, I I'm just going to break the news to everyone here. There's a lot of people coming in. We're the new it thing. We're the uh, hot, you know, boy, so to speak. We've been called hunks, hot guy babes. Anyways, it's their words, not ours, but we'll graciously accept it. But anyways, our motto is history, science, culture. And of course, we got my boy, Eric Helms, in the house with the PhD, talking science, dropping that knowledge, but they might forget that when we started, when we had the conversation many moons ago, when we had the existential crisis, and people think we're joking, but we're not joking after watching a movie called Hereditary, and we talked about having a podcast, and we want to talk about what it would encompass, the historical context of lifting was very important, as well as the culture, and that actually was the cornerstone of what we wanted to launch with Iron Culture. That's why it's called Iron 
culture. And that was the first few episodes. We had Dominic Moraes on. And so, Eric, things are kicking off. It's... <sighs> He already announced this. I might as well say it. Joe Rogaine, and I, I did the research. That's how you pronounce his last name. It is Italian. They in the me you know how the media does it where they mispronounce it. So I just want to correct. Mm. Yeah, because I, I know what it's like to have a, a name that's mispronounced. Uh, anyways, yeah. we're going on episode 100. We're going on there. So people might just be tuning in like, oh, Iron Culture, they're all about science. They might not know that we're actually also all about the history and the culture of lifting. Yeah, it's been it's been arguably too long since we've had a really solid historical episode. But for those who've been around since the start, for the, the iron culture hipsters, the people who <laughs> are working on having a catalog to lord over others to make them feel intellectually inferior, which there is, you know, no finer vice to have, my friends. Um, you may have forgotten that we had doctors, Ben Pollock and Dominic Moraes, Moraes than bees. Um, and we also had Dominic Moraes back on. Uh, and we've talked numerous times about history in connection to other topics. But today, we're back with a pure strength history uh, episode. We have another one of the individuals who has taken the trip to the Mecca uh, of, of, of strength history uh, out there in, uh, in Austin at the Stark Center at University of Texas at Austin. We have Dr. Connor Heffernan joining us today. And I'm pretty excited. Um, can I call you Connor? Ooh, let's not start off on the wrong foot. I, I, we'll go with Connor just this one time. I'll make an okay. exception. Mr. Dr. Right. Connor. How about, how about, how about Dr. Connor? Uh, is that too familiar? Um, I think Connor because I'm still questioning my own doctorate. So we'll, we'll just go with Connor for the episode today. Okay. All right. I, I appreciate that. So, so Connor, I just want to say welcome to the cult. Thank you for your time. And first, I think it would be great just if you could introduce yourself. And also after that, introduce what the Mecca is, where you are, and tell us about uh, this golden shining uh, history, uh, the, the uh, location that you are you are now in. Yeah, awesome. So I will start by getting my fangirling out of the way. This is a huge honor for me. I was listening back in the day, which in modern terms means about a year and a half ago <laughs> when you guys started and you had Dom and Ben on. So this is a really cool opportunity for me. I am in a similar uh, vein to Dom, Dominic Moraes and Ben Pollock, in that I study the history of strength. I am nowhere near as strong as those two men, but you know I can hang my hat intellectually with them. So what I do, and yes, people pay me, and no, I don't know why, is I study the history of strength and fitness and health in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So I have done a doctorate on physical culture in Ireland, and we'll talk about what physical culture during that time actually meant in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I'm pretty much driven by this quest to understand why do people want to look better naked? Because mm -hmm. when we really boil down to physical culture and gym cultures, strength plays a part of it, athleticism plays a part of it. But I think, you know, even in the dark recesses of our mind, there's a desire to look better naked. So when I'm teaching this to students at the University of Texas at Austin, I'm telling them we're going to look at all of these different phenomena. We're going to look at gender. We're going to look at race. We're going to look at sexism, society, class, whatever you want to name it. But we're going to look at why people want to look better naked. So that's me, slightly perverted, semi-successful historian. And then what I get to do is I get to teach at UT Austin, which is an incredible institution that obviously anyone with an interest in football knows about the Longhorns. And I am con contractually obliged to mention the Longhorns in any public outing that they let me loose on. But then I also work at the Stark Center for the History of Physical Culture and Strength Studies. And I know, Eric, you've had a chance to visit the Stark Center in the past. And for those who are unfamiliar with the Stark Center, this is a research library and repository that keeps the records, it's the annals of history are kept within the Stark Center for the Iron Game. So at the University of Texas in the Stark Center, we have the personal records of someone like Pudgy, Sand or Pudgy Stockton, we have the personal records of people like Bob Hoffman, who was the founder of York Barbell. We have a great deal of material from Joe Weider, who was obviously the man alongside Ben responsible for the Mr. Olympia competition. We have numerous kind of personal records of great lifters from the past, male and female. We have bodybuilding magazines going back 120 years. But more than that, we also have dumbbells, barbells, kettlebells, stones, paintings from decades ago, if not hundreds of years ago. And some of these are mind-blowing. We have Bob Peoples' deadlift bar. Bob Peoples, the great American powerlifter, deadlifts over 700 pounds. He had his own deadlifting bar, which is a wooden bar 
which has two baskets on either side of it. And I know, Eric, you would have seen this when you go to the stag center. And to increase the weight of this bar, he would go down, grab a rock, put the rock in the basket, go down, grab another rock, put another rock in the basket. Had no need for plates or anything fancy. Wooden barbell, rocks on either end. There is nothing more impressive than that. And the Stark Center is probably the only place in the world that is attempting to collect this history for people like Eric and people like Omar and people like myself to actually enjoy and consume the history of strength. And then is on an outreach mission, preaching to the masses, because the founders of the Stark Center, Professor Jan Todd and the late Professor Terry Todd, had a real interest in not only collecting this history, but sharing it with other people. Jan Todd and Terry Todd helped alongside Jim Larimer, Jim Larimer, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dave Webster, Bill Kazmar, and a host of other people to start the Arnold Strongman Classic. Jan and Terry Todd have worked like tirelessly with Rogue Fitness to produce documentaries on the history of physical culture, which are available on YouTube. Jan Todd and Terry Todd took an active role in preserving the history of powerlifting, the history of bodybuilding, weightlifting, through a free online journal called Iron Game History, which is available on the Stark Center website. So the Stark Center is this one-stop shop for preserving the history of the Iron Game, for you know continuing to teach people about the Iron Game, and for making sure that when we want to know, when was the first bodybuilding show? Why have people chosen three lifts for powerlifting? Why have they chosen two lifts for weightlifting? We know where that history comes from. So for a semi-successful historian like myself, who studies this history, I have to pinch myself every time I go into the Stark Center, and I'm not going into the Stark Center because the world is burning at the present moment, but when the world is calm and happy and nice and we're all friends, going into the Stark Center every day is such a wonderful um, opportunity because it is this treasure trove. It's an Aladdin's cave of letters, magazines, books, dumbbells, barbells, none of which I can lift, but I can take really impressive photographs of. So it really is, as you say, Eric, the mecca of this field and so a place that everyone should go to, or at least go to the website, which is the Stark Center, uh, com, because there is stuff online that you can play around with, old scrapbooks, magazines, journals, etc. So I think I've done my pitch pretty well. <laughs> oh, you did your pitch fantastically well. And, and if anyone thinks that he has some type of, you know, biased interest as someone who actually works as an academic there, uh, I can say he almost certainly does. But... Um, it, he comes by it honestly, and as an outsider, um, it truly was like like making a trip to Mecca, like like making uh, the Hajj, uh, making a pilgrimage to this place for me. And uh, in all seriousness, shortly after going there is when Omar Yusuf uh, and I discussed making a podcast. And the cornerstone for me, one of the things that influenced it to be Iron Culture, and not something like you know science chats with Omar and Eric or something like that, was that trip. And um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that Jan Todd met us there, that I got to meet a living legend. She gave us a, an effectively a backstage tour, uh, told us stories, showed us everything, uh, gave us her time. Uh, and it was one of the best experiences I've had uh, connecting with my roots, if you will, and, and actually finding a, a culture that I was invested and interested in, but not understanding just how rich it was. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that it exists and that there's passion to people like yourself behind it in all seriousness. So all I got to say is I'm clicking the like button on what you just said. Uh, I might even I might even hold it down, shift to the right, click that love button uh, just to show how much I feel about it. So that's all I got to say, Omar. Eric, I'm, I might create a secondary account just to give another like. Okay, normally I use that account just for conspiracy, not conspiracy theories, let's call them uh, theories that the mainstream as of yet have not adopted because they're sheeple. I normally use it just for dislikes and reporting, but I will make an exception. And I just want to echo uh, one. I think you did a fantastic job. We're ready already. Iron Culture is a unofficial, um, I wouldn't say extension, but we're here to proselytize. Okay, we are disciples. So that's why we're, we're bringing the mission to the forefront. People think, oh, like, oh, Eric, once again, I'm about to learn science. Um, no, you're going to learn about how connected you are with the past and now everything's interconnected. Eric, when we did meet up, I just want to echo that. He made me excited, okay? When he was talking about the Stark uh, Institute, the uh, Stark Center, and he was talking about uh, uh, Jan Todd and uh, everything like uh, going there, seeing it, everything being laid out and the true sense of being connected to something greater because we, I think because of the recency bias, because of social media, because of 
the availability of documenting modernity as such a, a, a easy of access, we often forget how far back it goes. So to see, you know, the 100 years, 150 years, or even further, how far back it goes, or when you said, uh, as an example, um, the deadlifter, Bob Peoples, um, uh, lifting over 700 pounds, and just the little things he did, and how these are almost, over the last several hundred years, innate aspects of humans wanting, as you said, to just look good naked. It's like, hey, this isn't just me. It goes way further back. And so uh, one of the things myself and Eric uh, spoke about was trying to honor the culture and the legacy and then bring it forward a little bit because even we uh, spoke with Mr. Moray's, uh more A's than B's, but talking about also- Dr. The Moray's. Doctor, Dr. Dom. D-Dom. D-D-Dom. Um, where the marketing that came in, you know, even with people like our boy uh, Eugene Sandow and all those things. And then uh, Ben Pollock, I think his a PhD was on Jack Belaine, right? Um, mm -hmm. So just very, very interesting things. And once again, if someone's listening and they think like, well, why would I care about the history? Man, you, you see so many cycles of repetition and so many patterns through time, across time, that you might just think, once again, oh, we've spoken off air, myself and Eric. Often it's like, oh, like whatever, this, this social media, like the, can you believe this person's marketing? It's like, actually, yeah, I can. This, this is the exact system that's been used. And I think you would like this, Connor, just to wrap up before I let you go on, my man, because, you know, we, we and initially this was, it wasn't a contractual obligation to have you on, but there were people in a very small segment, I would call them irrelevant uh, segment of the Iron Culture uh, group of listeners that said that the way we described another Irishman, uh, Danny Lennon, that it was inaccurate, that we made suggestions of his character. So we we knew, we and we were even told there, I think someone said in one of the comments that we were famine deniers, right? Um, yeah. 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 You remember that? I think, yeah. So, so representation is important. That's yeah. something we got to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So far, we've had um, not that many Irish. people from Ireland. Yeah. Um, and you notice I used person first language there, right? Uh, and a, I would say a large majority of them have been, and I'm not going to say who has claimed it, because yeah. we did let those original hosts go, mm -hmm. has claimed that they have been perhaps uh, serial killers, to put it lightly. Yeah. So I think it's accurate, important Eric. to have... Eric, it was accurate. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't our claim, and we have no, no comment on it legally. So I think it's important for us to have other people from Ireland who have not had any claims to maybe be serial killers. Uh, that is not the opinion of, of Iron Culture. It is just repeating of facts mm -hmm. uh, that may or may not be facts mm -hmm. uh, on. So not a contractual obligation, but but our duty because the representation is important. So thank you for coming on, Connor, uh, and not letting any past transgressions of prior hosts of this podcast who have made comments influence that decision negatively. I, I'm very worried if I'm now taken to be a representative of Ireland because for many years I fell into the keto trap. So I was a, one of the few Irish men not to drink or eat potatoes. So, I mean, people didn't know what to do with me in Ireland for many years. So I'm, I'm tentatively stepping into this role now as someone who enjoys sweet potatoes. So at least I have that. Whoa, you're getting spicy there, Connor. You better calm down. Oh, I mean, for for an Irish diet, I mean, we survived on cabbage and bacon for, you know, most of my childhood. So I'm going to tentatively step into the roles of Johnny Everyman yeah. uh, for the Irish populace and try and keep my sociopathic serial killer tendencies, you know, to the side. You know, if something ever happens, that's really going to be incriminating, but I'm a good person. <laughs> and I feel like if I... If I say that, I probably shouldn't need to say that. Let's continue with the podcast, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say we definitely move forward. And uh, just as a hint, hint, blame it on Danny. Yeah. And again, I wouldn't be too worried because we have a pretty low bar yeah. for a moral character yeah. uh, of your predecessor. So you're, you're good to go. You've definitely cleared it simply by not having uh, any green. rumors around your, you know, murderous. Anything like hobbies. that. Yeah, hobbies. Exactly. Needs a side hustle. We all get it. It's 2020. 100%. Uh, he's probably really uh, struggling with COVID, not being able to be out and about. Um, so in all seriousness, I think it would be really cool uh, if you could give the, the newer uh, Iron Culture listeners an understanding of what is physical culture. We've thrown around that term. So physical culture is one of these terms <clears throat> which it emerges in the late 1800s and really lasts until, say, the 1940s, 1950s when it gets replaced by other words like bodybuilding, powerlifting, 
you know, and then eventually we'll have things like crossfitting, zumbing, Orange Theory fitnessing. And effectively what physical culture means at its core, because there are dozens and dozens of definitions which are thrown around, means the practice of going to the gym and lifting weights. Now, some people will give it a very highfalutin term, like the development of every muscle in the body to the creator's greatest ambitions. No, it's going to the gym and lifting weights. And it's a very simple term, but it takes on this remarkable power in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Because we have centuries of gymnastics and calisthenics, which Ben and Dom talked about when they were on, but it's in the late 1800s that this entirely new word is created and put forth into society, physical culture, which will then be applied to going to the gym, lifting weights, but more importantly, it will be applied to marketing campaigns, to selling books, to selling dumbbells, to selling barbells, magazines, to marketing competitions, be they bodybuilding or weightlifting magazine or weightlifting competitions, and it will be used by politicians, physicians, writers, people of note in British and American societies, and it becomes a global phenomenon. So we see the term physical culture beginning, say, really in England or being popularized in England in the late 1800s. By 1910, I can go to India and say physical culture, and people will know what I'm talking about. I can go to Australia, I can go to New Zealand, I can go to Canada, I can go to the United States, parts of South America. They know what physical culture means. If I say I am a physical culturist, this is similar today to someone saying I'm a powerlifter, bodybuilder, weightlifter, crossfitter, whatever the case may be. So this is the first time in history, or really since the ancient Greeks, that we have a very clear definitive term being applied to the practice of lifting weights. And it is this new turn because what people are doing in 1900 is not so different to what they're doing in 1870 or 1880. But this idea of physical culture, it's new, it's sexy, it's something different. And this is where the power of it comes from because then we start to see this huge upsurge in popularity in going to the gym. And we'll talk about some of the individuals who are at the forefront of that, who call themselves physical culturists, their disciples physical culturists. So it's this new word for going to the gym. And it sounds so much better than just hitting, you know, hitting the gym. I'm a physical culturist. It comes with this sort of gravitas, doesn't it? It's not like, you know, well, I'm going to pound the pavement for a few hours. It's like, no, that man or woman is a physical culturist. Let them be. So it has this gravitas that I think really helps to expand the fitness industry in its kind of kernel or in its early beginnings. And what, what, what is so remarkable about it to me is that we go from, like you said, the late 1800s to only a decade or two into the 1900s, and it's become a global phenomenon. And this is before transatlantic flights. This is before the internet. This is before, I mean, if you were write a letter to someone about this, it it's going to take months, you know, to get there in, in certain cases if they're not in the same country as you. So the fact that it spread like wildfire to me is is just as shocking as is just how new this concept was and how, uh, you know, ri rich the history is and how diverse it is. So I think that that's really intriguing to me and just how much there was uh, this became a cultural zeitgeist. Um, is it accurate for me to say that that prior to it becoming something that uh, people identified with uh, war as a label and became uh, a member of and, and would label themselves as this. Is it accurate to saying that it was primarily something that was entertainment in, in the vaudeville era? Yeah, so this is one of the key strains of the modern fitness industry. If we think about, say, fitness in 2020, it would shock a lot of people to think about that. There are three key areas where the fitness industry is born. There's the military, and I think we can all see maybe the transfer from there. There is schools, physical education, and then there is entertainment, the music hall, the circus, vaudeville. And it is through the music hall, circus and vaudeville, that physical culture, that weightlifting actually moves to the masses in a very meaningful way. Because in military physical education, in schools, physical education, it's largely confined to those institutions. We've all had terrible PE teachers. I've never had a desire to be like, well, you know, when he was screaming at me, I thought it'd be great to do that in my free time. That would be wonderful. Run some laps around the field of being screamed at by a man who's smoking. Again, I'm not a good representative for Ireland. But it's through the circus, the vaudeville, the music hall, where people see someone like a Eugene Sandow, a Louis Sear, a Katie Sandwina, whoever the case may be. And then they say, God, I would really like to look like that individual, or I would like to train, I would like to lift weights. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, these people who 
traditionally would have stayed within the music hall, the vaudeville stage, the circus. You wouldn't have heard of them. They would come to your town, lift weights, impress everyone with a feat of strength, then go to the next town. They start to sell magazines. They start to sell books. They start to sell workout equipment. They start to open gymnasiums. And they do so under that term of physical culture. And it is through the entertainment wing that physical culture practices start to bleed out because it is the entertainers who are also the entrepreneurs. So this is a story of success in spreading fitness, but also a story of success of selling fitness. And Uh there is this distinction between spreading and selling, Mm -hmm. and the two can't be kind of split apart because the people who are at the forefront of this are the people who are trying to sell you stuff as well. So selling shake weights and other dubious products is as old as time itself when it comes to the fitness industry. But it's a really important part of this industry because people will buy Eugene Sandow's workout books. And we'll talk about Sandow in a few moments' time. They will buy nutritional supplements promoted by someone like Arthur Saxon. They will buy magazines about Louis Sear because they want to know more. So the selling and spreading approach is actually really crucial to how physical culture becomes globalized and moves from the confines of the music hall to actual gymnasiums, to you know, medical offices, to schoolyards, to private homes, etc. I think it is important to note that a lot of this comes from the entertainment industry, which then explains why the, you know, the modern fitness industry is defined by Randy Roach's wonderful term, muscle, smoke and mirrors, mm-hmm. because we've always had that element of entertainment, of pizzazz, of exaggerating one's numbers, because that's what you do in an entertainment industry. Eric Connor, you know, go ahead, Omar. No, I was going to say just real quickly, I think we're washing our hands of several things today. And what I mean is that we've been accused that we critique capitalism too much in this, but it's intertwined. uh, Once again, you're saying the marketing with spreading of the word all the way since the inception. And I just want to say very quickly uh, after what Eric says, I'm curious to hear if there's the first-hand, second-hand accounts, the newspapers at the time, because I can only imagine we don't have access to this, Eric. What I'm very curious about, Eugene Sandow, the first time that the masses see a true muscled physique, a muscular physique of that magnitude that's so much beyond their everyday occurrence, to see a Grecian statue in person, I'm just curious how much it blew people's minds, because if you remember, many people probably watched Pumping Iron, and Pumping Iron, even at that time in the 1970s, there was that situation where they were posing at like, a, I think it was an art gallery. But once again, it was so novel still at the time to see men that muscle bound, uh, men and women, that it caused quite a stir. And we don't have, we take that for granted now where we see on Instagram or whatnot, you grow up in this era, we're seeing bodybuilders, uh, well-conditioned physiques from, you know, a young age. And it just makes me think very quickly of back in the day when I was a young lad, there's a, a store called Gamepad. And they were introducing for the first time 3D games. Eric, do you remember that, Con? Do you remember that? I was a young lad. I had to go there. I had to be lifted by my brother up so I could see uh, through the, uh, above to the counter. The guy brought from Japan, who's Japanese, a Sega Saturn. And we're seeing Virtua Fighter, the 3D graphics. For, and it, like when I say it blew my mind, I can't understate that. And I only think now in this modern era, I have a cousin... You know, so let's say this person's now 15. They've grown up with the internet. I try to show them a new video game. It has all these new graphics. I was like, yeah, I already saw that on YouTube. Like they're they're just so non-fussed about everything because it's it's so part of their everyday experience. They take it for granted. So just afterwards, I'm very curious because from a historical uh, perspective, that first and second hand accounts of newspapers or eyewitnesses, when you see someone who looks so clearly different than everyone else. What the response would be? That's that's like the first in- instance, guys, of Myron. Like you, Myron, bro. Like I, I can only imagine the collective jaws dropping. Go ahead, Eric. No, no, no. I, I think I'd love to get Connor's thoughts on that first because mine is going to be a a, a a big divergence. Go ahead. This is a wonderful question, and everything I'm about to say is bastardized from works written by David Chapman, David Waller, John Todd, Dave Webster, and a lot of it is available freely on the Sandow website or on the Sandow documentary produced by Rogue Fitness. Eugene Sando, and this is no exaggeration, his entrance into the public sphere would do Vince McMahon proud. So in 1889, Sando is training in Belgium with his mentor, Professor Attila, and they get word that there is a strong man in London named Samson who's offering a cash prize and the title of the world's strongest man or the strongest man on earth to anyone who can best him in a feat of strength. Now, Professor Attila and Sando being particularly ingenious uh, people, they decide to take 
Samson up on his feet of strength. They travel to London. They scope out Samson's shows for about a week or two. And then eventually the time comes. Samson, going through, this, you know, going through the motions, can any man defeat me? Cash prize, plaudits, everyone will cheer your name. Sandow puts up his hand, says, I will challenge you. You know, gasp, awe, people turn around. And they see a man in a suit that is too large for him. He looks comical. People laugh at Sandow. Samson's a little bit confused by this very weedy man, or seemingly weedy man, who wants to claim, like, challenge him and claim this prize and claim this title. He allows the audience to laugh. He quietens them down, hushes the audience, says, of course, come on on stage. Before he gets on stage, he rips off his suit, a la Magic Mike, or a la, I don't know why, just Channing Tatum stuck on my mind, but a la Magic Mike to reveal this physique, which is ripped, chiseled, and muscular. What was once laughter is now shock. People have not seen a physique like this in their lifetimes. In Victorian Britain, because this is 1889, so Queen Victoria is still on the throne, in Victorian Britain, people have a great awareness of Greek and Roman statues. They have an awareness of strongmen, and Eric, as you mentioned, kind of musical on the vaudeville. But strongmen during this time are predominantly overweight. They're very beefy dudes. Sandow is not. He is a prototype bodybuilder. So when he reveals his physique in such an unexpected and shocking way, it sends thrills through the crowd. Samson backtracks. He says, no, 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 no. I don't want to face you. To face me, you have to defeat my assistant, Cyclops. Sandow beats Cyclops. Samson doesn't know what to do. He says, I'm not going to face you tonight because everyone's tired. We all want to go home. Come back in two or three days and we can then, you know, you can challenge me for the crown. Sandow goes off. Samson goes off. They come back two to three days later. The theater is sold out. People are clamoring to get in because in that two to three day period, People are writing numerous columns. So many trees are murdered, writing about Eugene Sando, this man who has come from nowhere. No one knows who he is. No one knows how he trains. No one knows how someone could attain this sort of physique. So his celebrity is created in that two to three day period between beating Cyclops and then, spoiler alert, going back on stage and beating Samson. So from 1889 to his death in 1925, Sando is seen as the world's most perfectly developed specimen. This is verified by Dudley Allen Sargent during Sandow's tour of the United States when Sargent measures Sandow's physique, judges it against hundreds of other men and women who he's measured, and says Sandow is the epitome. But even prior to this time, in 1889, Sandow attains this godlike status because he has a physique that no one has ever seen. He has a physique that is revealed in a WWF, WWE sort of way. The only thing that's missing is the glass breaking and Stone Cold coming down to the stage. <laughs> and Sando does something very clever. Is that he says, you too can get a physique like me. So he is attainable. He is telling people that you can develop this physique if you follow my programs, my workouts, my eat my nutritional supplements, buy my workout devices. So the excitement that is created around Sando's physique in 1889 lasts until the outbreak of the Great War in 1914 and then comes back tentatively from 1919. But really up until the emergence of Arnie in the 70s, people are still writing about Sandow's physique in the Iron Game and how wonderful it is, and how he's the epitome of health and perfection for men. So from his debut to long after his death, people are still in awe of Sandow. And if people haven't, Rogue Fitness's 40 minute documentary couldn't do a better job in showing just how impressive this physique is before gyms are common or wide place it's very difficult to get access to heavy weights there's no anabolic steroids Sandow says himself that he doesn't really follow any sort of diet he just eats what he wants he's one of those SOBs and he is a genetic freak he's able to do a somersault holding two dumbbells so he's a genetic freak who's a great showman who is able, is able to capture the imagination of people in this incredible and just such a theatrical way no, I, I love it. And I think um, this actually is a, a even better lead in than where I was going to go with before is I think most people who get as an amateur, and I can speak for myself here, interested in the history of the Iron Game or physical culture, they start with perhaps some element of distaste for what is currently going on in some sector. They don't like the way it's being marketed. Uh, they're disillusioned with uh, what they view as widespread use of anabolic steroids. That's another common one I run across. 
not my own personal reason. Um, they are uh, don't, don't like lifting gear in, in, in powerlifting. I don't know what these guys could lift. You know, they, they, they become purists. They want to go back to this time when in their mind they've romanticized it. They put it on a pedestal and it is pure. It's better. Um, and while it is pure and it is much more small, you also, if you get serious about it, if you move from being like just kind of the, the emotionally driven amateur to someone who's actually interested in reading about the history, uh, you kind of have to face the fact that history is often not pretty and that, yes, marketing was there at the very beginning. And that Sandow was telling you that if you drink his cocoa, uh, you might be able to get some big biceps. And that if you lift like, you know, five pound dumbbells, you'll look like him. And, you know, what, what really did it for me is I got uh, Muscle Town USA, mm -hmm. which is all about uh, Bob Hoffman. And I've shared this on the cult before, but man, he is like the epitome of just like all of the worst aspects of masculinity. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's like comically egotistical. Uh, I remember he, like th there's, there's parts where far, long after he retired as, 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 a, as a competitor, he would create obscure challenges against like the lightest weight other people uh, and, and try to beat them and not do like any conversion based on body weight. So you've got this guy who's like, you know, 38 <laughs> and he's like, yeah, what about like a, a, a one handed uh, sandbag lift that I've been practicing for the last six months? I didn't tell anybody that. And you, Mr. 150 pound weightlifter, let's see if you can beat me. And he beats him by like a pound and he declares himself, you know, uh, the winner. And so like <laughs> seeing that, um, it's very difficult to... To, to, to make someone just one thing or to make a, an era one thing. Uh, when, you know, when you read about how many deserving African-Americans who probably should have won Mr. America didn't because they didn't meet the quote unquote cultural standards, you know, and they just won most muscular for a long time. So I found it interesting that uh, I think a lot of people, they romanticize the past uh, instead of being able to take a holistic view and being able to accept the good and the bad. Like, as much as I don't think I'd want to hang out with Bob Hoffman, I'm incredibly grateful for the fact that he used his industry to actually prop up American weightlifting. And he led to the birth of powerlifting. He led to the, uh, honestly, the birth of the Iron Game in many ways, in, in my opinion, you know, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s before there was any other dominant voice. So you have to hold these two things. You have to be, you know, semi-critical of, of certain aspects and go, oh, I see the roots of that thing I don't like now in, in history, you know, because these modern things we hate about Instagram, they didn't come out of nowhere. They weren't just <laughs> invented by, by the evil social media people. You know, it wasn't just like steroids happen and everyone, you know, this, this changed their, their, their views. Like people were happy steroids came out. <laughs> don't get me wrong. You know? So I think, I think it's important to be able to let go of that romanticism, but still have respect for it. Uh, and to learn your roots and to learn your roots with a critical, open-minded and maybe unbiased perspective. And I, I want to, so my question to you, Connor, is was there a transition period for you as someone who ostensibly was very interested in the history, but then becoming an academic, regardless of your field, whether you're a quantitative sports scientist like me, or whether you're a historian who focuses on physical culture history, you almost have to make your 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 belief system all centered on being unbiased. How was that transition for you? It's very difficult um, because dead people are rarely disappoint you, and as you kind of mentioned, you know, you can dress people up in the most wonderful of ways. I was very lucky because when I started to get serious about my own training, I trained in a gymnasium or in a gym which still exists today, Hercules Gym in Dublin. It was founded in 1935, still exists today. That is impressive, just to give props to Hercules for any gym to last longer than 10 years. That's not a chain as impressive. 1935. But when I was training, I got to train with lifters who were in their 60s and 70s. They had done it all. They were, you know, European powerlifters, great natural bodybuilders, great untested bodybuilders, weightlifters, whatever the sport it was, they had done it. They informed me very early on about all of the nitty gritty, all the dirt from the fitness industry. So it was training with those guys and then I had the joy, the pleasure, the fortune to read Randy Roach's Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, um, which came out just as I was getting serious about studying the history of the Iron Game. And Randy, aside from being a wonderful human being, is also a really great writer for people who want to know more. He's a great, um, I'm reticent to use the term gateway drug in any discussion on fitness, but he's a great 
gateway read uh, for the fitness industry. And he shows, Eric, as you're saying, and Omar, you've touched on as well, this kind of tension between what they did was great in some instances, but these guys could be some real asshats at times. So even Sandow, who arguably kickstarts the modern interest in bodybuilding and he advances gyms and he does world tours of India, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, Ireland, and other states, which again spreads the global spread of physical culture. He sues Arthur Saxon after Saxon beats him in a weightlifting competition because <coughs> Saxon is then advertising himself as the man who beats Sandow. He disputes a weightlifting loss against Hercules McCain. He sues Professor Selazi, who he claims has ripped off his dumbbell. He claims that he invented a Sandow dumbbell. Selazi has invented a similar dumbbell. I'm going to sue you until you stop selling it. Sandow arguably steals ideas at certain points in his career, but he is still very important. So we can hold that tension between someone being very important and doing good things while also being quite deplorable in other aspects of their life because the fitness industry, unfortunately, is tragically human. Because as we're dealing with the human body, we are dealing with the human ego. So from time memoriam, we have people exaggerating lifts. We have entrepreneurs trying to run each other out of business. And Eric, you mentioned Muscle Town. So much of Muscle Town leads into Bob Hoffman's entrepreneurial fights with other people, be it someone like um, Perry Rader, who runs Iron Man magazine, or Joe Weider. And the t Joe Weider and Bob Hoffman have a very antagonistic relationship, which is horrible for them, but great for the fitness industry because it pushed the industry to newer and better heights. So we do always have this tension between they did good, wouldn't want to share a beer with them. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that, thankfully, I learned very early on through somewhat jaded Irish uh, powerlifters who I have much love for, and then Randy Roach's book, Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, which will actually just lay out in meticulous detail the good, the bad, and the downright ugly of the fitness industry. Because it is something that, you know, people think Instagram is bad in 2020. If they had it 120 years ago, <laughs> it would be exactly the same. And that's just dealing with the human condition, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your disposition. I think you said it really well. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's been my experience 100%. And um, almost any time you put something or someone on a pedestal uh, and, and a very unrealistic high pedestal, the only thing you can be sure of is you're probably setting yourself up for disappointment, at least to some level. Um, so I think that applies to history as well. As much as we, we venerate what's come before us, uh, we seek to understand it fully because hopefully it helps us better understand ourselves. Um, so for anyone who is, you know, maybe thinking of clicking on a different episode or is not hanging around at this point, let me just say a couple things. Times where I've found history has really been a beneficial thing to understand or to help others understand. Um, so people think that full body training and bodybuilding is a new phenomenon. You know, uh, Menno Henselman's, Jeff Nippert, Eric Helms, these guys are doing this new thing. It's crazy. And some people who are, who don't like it go, that's, you know, don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We should all be doing body part splits. However, if you're aware of how people trained, I would say from the 1800s all the way through the mid 1900s into the 1940s and 1950s, almost everybody in bodybuilding was training full body and they started the transition to like upper lowers. That's one example. Uh, also, if you're someone who is in the diet wars and you think it's either, you know, keto or you think it's carnivore, uh, or you think fasting is a thing and like, Oh, Martin Birkin, you know, the past, the, 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 the new saint of, of fasting, nah, Bernard McFadden was doing that shit in the 1900s. So anytime you find yourself thinking that if just everyone would adopt with religious devotion, like I have this one way. You probably forgot that happened in 1900 and didn't catch on for a reason. Um, so very few things are new. Uh, and you can only know that if you knew what came before. But if you've been in, like you jokingly said before, uh, an adherent of only back in the day, which in modern times means the last year and a half, <laughs> then you're missing out on that. And you're much more prone to go down rabbit holes that have actually been well dug. You're just not aware of it. Whew. One of my favorite quotes, I know Charles Poliquin isn't uh, everyone's cup of tea, but he, there was a great quote from Charles Poliquin where he says, if you want to learn something new in the fitness industry, open a book from 50 or 60 years ago. Because you said there has been so many well-worn paths. And when we get things like the first bodybuilding shows in the early 1900s, weightlifting has been at the Olympics since 1896, organized powerlifting has been around since the 60s, people have worried and stressed and spent hours and lives trying to figure out how to get stronger, how to be bigger 
how, how to show you know more lean muscle tissue. So a lot of the debates we have now, they are advancing this body of knowledge, but that history behind it actually can lead us into new rabbit holes. And if you can look at what someone has done and try and figure out where they went wrong or try and figure out maybe the reason why they were studying it in such a way, that can then inform new ways of doing things. And it's not to say that it was better 50 to 60 years ago, but rather that we can stand on the shoulders of giants and then let that inform kind of new ways and new pathways. And that is something which I think tends to get lost in this kind of very quick, snackable culture of information, is that some of these debates have lasted for hundreds of years. I mean, I'm doing a course next year at my grad or next semester with graduate students on the history of um, sports nutrition. And we're looking about the keto, vegetarian, high carb debate from the 1700s and 1800s. So, I mean, these are not new ideas, but we are advancing them with more information. So, yeah, if you can learn from the past or even appreciate the past, you can be a little bit more creative about the future or what you're going to do next. No, I was going to say, uh, Omar, go yeah. for it. I, I was going to say, man, that uh, I think there's a lot of value in studying history. And myself and Eric have talked about this before, where you, you could try and understand the tradition, respect it, but also improvise over top. And I gave the example of Eugene Sandow or the first uh, you. Uh, Connor talking about the first hand, second hand accounts of individuals where he disrobes and everyone is, you know, gassed, uh, you know, uh, completely just astonished at the physique that sometimes in the modern era, uh, the comparison being the thief of joy is that if we don't have that context, where sometimes if you attach yourself to a greater legacy or understanding where it's like, well, wait a second now, it, you know, you throw up. So Eugene Sandow was making collective jaws drop, you know, 100 years ago, 120 years ago. And you post him on, you know, Reddit bodybuilding, let's say natural bodybuilding. Let's just say, let, let's say he didn't exist then, but he's a modern, and boom, we drop a sand down to 2020. And he's like, hey guys, rate my physique. He would get a 4.5 out of 10 on T Nation, right? He'd be told, as like, well, you know, like Eugene, like you got this, you got to bring this up, all these things. And we learn from the past and we've proven, I mean, sports nutrition training program, all these things have risen uh, so much geometrically over the last several decades. Um, but when you're just taking a look at yourself and you're thinking, oh, like I'm comparing myself to the best possible person on Instagram and you see how standards have changed. And that doesn't mean that your standards should change, but you're living in a very modern context. And I think a lot of kind of strength athletes, just very quickly, not a, a huge tangent, have experienced this a little bit. If you've been around the scene, like Eric and myself, eight, nine years ago, it could have went, and I'm not throwing us under the bus or anything, but you could go to nationals. There was a lower, there was a smaller uh, 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 pool of athletes. And so you thought it's kind of like, oh, not only strength for everyone, you know, I could take it very far. I could go to nationals, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Now we're seeing uh, recently, give a shout out to some modern athletes. Taylor Atwood shattering the 74K, like doing weights that would have been previously unthinkable. Russell Orhe, same idea. He just posted a mock meet where he did 865 kilos, basically weighing 83 kilos. So just insane weights over 1,900 pounds. Ashton, this other guy, uh, Ruska, where he just totaled over like, 950. I'm, bro, what was that? <laughs> uh, what, what was it? 20. Uh, he totaled. 9.50 Yeah, uh, at, I think, a body weight of... Uh, sorry, 9.50.5. I robbed yeah. a man of a pound there. Um, at uh, at whatever 217 pounds yeah. is in kilos. I want to say that's like 208, maybe? Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, sorry. Uh, at like... 217, I think he that? said he weighed in on that meat, which is a weird... Like, I guess he just didn't... That's like 98 or something. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. I said 208, which doesn't make any sense. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, that's, it's insane. Just and we're and we're witnessing this now as the pool, the size gets bigger and bigger, more entrants are uh, entering, and people maybe feel that. And I see that in comments where people almost because they they think there's a, a ceiling now placed on them, or they understand that there might be tears. Well, wait, why like why even try? And that's something that we often actually get, Connor, just in our little bubble as an example. And Eric's done a really good job with uh, Team Three DMJ and some of his teachings. It's like, well, if I'm not going to look, if I can't look like Arnold, you know, that whole idea is like, well, why, why even try in the first place? And they lose the context of the journey and just the amount of individuals that have uh, done the journey. And also, once again, like, that's why when we joked, <laughs> I joked with Eric, I'm like, yo, dog, we take our physique back 120 years ago. We're there in America. We we disrobe. Woo! Just just imagine what would happen. But in all seriousness, the context of the moment where we're very much in the present moment. And if we don't get that perspective then we could get kind of engulfed by the enormity of the situation. I, th I think it'd be a valuable aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're at a really 
interesting moment in the fitness industry and Eric and Omar you've both talked about this where even I know myself having grown up on kind of the forums of tnation and bodybuilding.com <laughs> that you know back then the strength standards were so different to now when you're on say reddit and either the weight room powerlifting bodybuilding etc like everyone is has a massive deadlift everyone has a massive squat everyone has a massive bench press everyone looks like they're ready to compete you know as a professional in bodybuilding but that just simply wasn't the case say 10 15 20 years ago and I think this kind of crescendo of knowledge has really advanced standards across the board and as more people join the fitness industry in whatever their sport is standards improve but if we look at the longer history of fitness we'll see that people like Sandow who you know are selling snake oil at different parts in their careers they are talking about fitness across the life cycle I think this is something that tends to be drowned out by a lot of other in, uh, outlets in the fitness industry because we're so concerned about getting on the platform now with these impressive numbers that are beyond the pale of what people considered exceptional 20, 30, or 40 years ago. I think something that I love about this podcast is you have people talking about lifting during pregnancy, lifting at every stage of the life cycle, because that is the essence of physical culture. For all of the crap that Sandow and others were trying to sell, they were saying this is for people who are 30, 40, 50, 60. And it wasn't, they were saying you can look like Sandow, but they were also saying be the best that you can do and I think now we're at this unique moment in the fitness industry where 10 minutes on Instagram will kill any powerlifting, bodybuilding, weightlifting, crossfitting dream, even running around the block, doing a 5K around the block. 10 minutes on Instagram will kill your motivation because now we're at this point where everyone's exceptional at that elite level and there's more people. But the actual tenor and the origin of the fitness industry is health, strength, and perfection, whatever that means for your context, at every age group. And I think for me... That's the, one of the bigger benefits of studying the history is you, A, get to see what you know people looked like 120 years ago. And maybe for some, with my genetics, born in Ireland of Irish farmer stock, just about <laughs> survived the potato famine. You know, maybe it's more acceptable for me to look at someone you know, from Sandow's era in a pre-steroidal era closer to the Irish famine and say, well, maybe I can build up and exceed that level. Others, the genetically uh, blessed or genetically normal, can look at someone now and try and aspire to that. But I think at both ends of it, whatever your level is, you should be thinking about health and strength across the life cycle. And that is a message that's so strong in the early 1900s, which tends to be dropped out because we want the next Instagram pic. We want the video of the high deadlift. We want to impress people with the snatch or the clean and jerk. We're doing it for the gram, for want of a better phrase. So I think one of the huge values in studying the history of physical culture is opening our eyes to the fact that this can and should be a lifelong pursuit because that's what it was meant to be. I think that's kind of the, the benefit or the excellence of this pursuit for a lot of us. And that's an excellent transition to, to one thing I wanted to talk about is that as it moved from vaudeville to cultural phenomenon, and, there, and like you said, there were elements of this in the vaudeville era, like you just talked about, uh, where, where Sandow challenged you know, Cyclops. Uh, and then, and then challenged, um, help me out here, Samson. Samson. Yeah. The, it moved to having a competitive air, you know, and that, that, so that comparison didn't, didn't come out of nowhere, you know? Um, of course this is human nature to compare yourself to others, uh, to some degree, but as we moved from it being vaudeville, the cultural phenomenon, something happened in the early 1900s and then mid 1900s where, uh, the physical culture became sport and it became powerlifting or i should say before that it became weightlifting and there became uh you know then powerlifting grew from that and before that there became physique contests then eventually we look up today and we've got double digit numbers of ways to compete in physical culture um and with all of it, every little iteration in between i'm the uh you know single ply bench only masters two uh south dakota champ you know um that's probably a real thing and if you're listening well done, and and uh, and also thank you for for listening. Um, so, I, I would love to hear your perspective on how did we move from this being something that was about uh, changing culture, uh, in promoting fitness across a lifespan, and trying to hold that, like we said, in tension uh, with with some of the other aspects that are coming from it. And and I think honestly, this this is a huge challenge for a lot of people who are dedicated to weightlifting is because this competitive nature and actual competitive sports are so intertwined with physical culture, it is 
you have to actively try to not compare yourself to others, to stay motivated, to have uh, you know a focus on the journey. And uh, ironically, it's crazy to me that considering bodybuilding is almost the direct descendant to physical culture, and that physical culture had these roots in promoting wellness across the lifespan through lifting weights, that by creating, say, 3D muscle journey or having these conversations on iron culture, I'm a dissident. I am an iconoclast. I am a counter narrative uh, against, you know, be the best, uh, you know, and, and this kind of win at all costs mentality. And from the more common attitudes you would see uh, in bodybuilding where it's, you know, it's hardcore. Hardcore, quote unquote, means do anything and everything you can uh, to make gains. So I would love to hear, how, how did we get here? How did mu- what, what we promote at 3D Muscle Journey and what we promote here at Iron Culture, how did that become a necessary antidote to all the disaffected people who, who don't get to be the best? And often, many times, as we found from having you know, Bryce Lewis on, even the people who are the best manage to feel inadequate with this mentality. So how did we get here, Connor? Yeah, and it's uh, it's an easy question. No, um, so one of the things just to say, which is so interesting, because I'm a huge bodybuilding fan, both professional and then the history of it, and it's so interesting to look at the first major bodybuilding competition or physique show, Eugene Sanders, great competition, 1901. The judging criteria for that looked at things like skin tone, glow, overall health, and vitality. They explicitly said the most muscular person will not necessarily be chosen because we have this framework, you know, based on kind of an overall or holistic health. One of the, th- we'll start with bodybuilding and move into some of the other sports. This kind of hits the tone for the next several decades. So Bernard McFadden has a bodybuilding show or physique competition in 1904 and 1905. Again, a more kind of holistic, we're going to look at mind, body and soul sort of approach to it. There's a most handsome man competition in the 1920s won by Charles Atlas. Uh, side note, is that not the best competition to win? Like, forget Mr. Olympia. People don't know what Mr. Olympia is. If you are the most handsome man in the world, people know what that is. So we have a handsome man competition, and then we have the Mr. America show in 1939, which looks at your physique, your athletic ability, and then your personality. Now, this will, and Eric mentioned, this will become problematic for African-American athletes in the 1950s, 1960s, because they will fail or lose points on kind of personality and athleticism, largely for racial reasons, is the kind of insinuation. But up until, say, the 1940s, 1950s, bodybuilding has always been interested in more than just the physique, be it glow, vitality, and skin, be it your personality, be it your ability to lift weights, whatever the case may be. It changes in the 50s and 60s. Anabolic steroids is a really important part of that. But then also we have the development of things like the Mr. Olympia, because Joe Weider and Ben Weider, who are so influential in the sport, they realize that people no longer care about their athletic ability. They don't care about their personality. They just care about their physique. Mr. Olympia show, the first shows in 1965, one of the great selling points is, guys, I don't care if you have the personality of a damp sponge. I don't care if you can't put your toes. I don't care if you can't lift a barbell. You look good, you're going to win. So we have this shift in the 60s to just the physique. And I think when you test on one metric alone, that then can encourage a kind of ramping up and an intensity or insanity, to quote Steve Mitchlock or Mr. America from the 1970s. And that can kind of descend into who's the biggest, who's the strongest, who's the leanest. When we have anabolic steroids, when we have new advances in nutrition, this will lead to a race to the biological bottom. And it's very hard to pull ourselves back from that. And then because professional bodybuilding is the litmus test, and I think Eric, you've mentioned this before, in natural bodybuilding, we're probably push, it's probably pushing people to excessively low levels of body fat that are fine on a professional stage, but in a natural show, it can really mess with you biologically because it's trying to mimic and ape the kind of standard bearer, which is professional bodybuilding. So I think there is a natural human inclination to push boundaries. And when you remove other metrics, which can kind of act as a break, like requiring people, let's put the personality one aside because, come on. But, you know, if you required people to have a healthy overall vitality, to look at their skin, to look at their overall health, to see can they lift weights or touch their toes or do a backflip, whatever the athletic component will be, that kind of puts a break on a one-minded focus on muscularity and leanness above all else. And this is something which will creep into other sports. So weightlifting at the Olympics begins in 1896. 
they use 10 lifts. No one uses them anymore. It comes again in 1904. They use another 10 lifts. They're different to 1896. No one uses them anymore. There's a clip on YouTube of someone spinning a barbell on the soles of his feet while he's lying on the ground. You know, listen, whatever works for your brother, but that's not going to work in a weightlifting competition. In the 1920s, they introduced the clean, the jerk, the clean, jerk, the snatch, the military press. This will be kind of the trifecta until the 1970s when they remove the military press. Again, we see that once they formulate it on three very simple standards, people don't need to have, say, an overall athleticism. And this is not to denigrate Olympic weightlifting because Olympic weightlifters brought me up and I have the utmost respect for that sport. But when you can funnel everything down into three lifts, and it's the same thing which I suppose plagues powerlifting as well, is that when you funnel things down, it leads to a kind of race to the bottom because everything leads to building numbers above all else in these scenarios. So Olympic weightlifting suffers from in the 1940s, 1950s. Anabolic steroids ups the ante again. Bigger numbers are all that matters. We don't care how you get there. This is not an exaggeration. The military press is removed in the 1970s because weightlifters are cheating in pushing the bar overhead. And when I say cheating, I mean they have such excessive leaning back. If you could see the arches in their back as they're pushing the bar overhead, it moves from a military press to a kind of inclined bench and I don't know, it's a testament of the human spine that more Olympic weightlifters from the 60s and 70s did not slip discs pushing the bar overhead. And John Fair has a wonderful article about this kind of bastardization of the military press. Because once people specialize on a very narrow set of criteria, they will do anything and everything to increase the numbers on those criteria. Powerlifting, Ben Pollock, uh, Don Marais, and John Todd wrote a wonderful article on the introduction of powerlifting equipment and some of the power, first powerlifting meets in the 60s and 70s people would wrap themselves tightly in bed sheets they would stick half cut tennis balls behind their knees because these types of equipment these really crude types of equipment would increase their powerlifting numbers then we get more sophisticated equipment like squat suits bench suits etc anabolic steroids is again the specter of the feast but i think when we see this incessant push to be better which is an innate human desire and my former advisor, Paul Rouse, always talks about the innate human desire for play, but then the innate human desire for competition. When this starts to creep in on very limited criteria, which is what happens in the 20th century, and all sports need to specialize, but the thing which affects the fitness industry is the introduction of anabolic steroids in the 50s and 60s, because not only are we specializing, but Jesus, we can push the body beyond any biological, you know, possibility that we had ever thought of before so i think the move from holistic health which is at the core of physical culture in the 1900s to what we have today and what we have today is wonderful in many aspects but it's also very demoralizing is that the specialization in these three major realms crossfitting is a, a new baby in the fitness industry but specialization in bodybuilding begins in the 1960s specialization in olympic weightlifting begins in the 1920s, specialization in powerlifting begins in the 1960s, and by that I mean the criteria is set in stone and it's very narrow. Once we have that, people are going to really limit their options and just train for these uh, lifts or just train for this kind of bodybuilding criteria. Then we introduce anabolic steroids at the elite level, which pushes things even further, and it is a race to the biological bottom. So it is that specialization in different time periods, which I think narrows options, because if you think John Grimmick, is a weightlifter, who's also a bodybuilder, who can also, you know, do the splits. Tommy Kono is a weightlifter, who's also a bodybuilder. Once we start to see intense specialization, people don't do that. And I will say, yes, I'm aware that Eddie Hall and Thor are about to fight in a boxing match. <laughs> but in general, people don't change lanes in such dramatic ways anymore, which they would have done at the kind of early origins of physical culture and of the fitness industry in the 1900s. Connor, and I think... I think if anyone thinks for more than a few seconds right now, they can start to get a perspective on just how much things have changed. Uh, kind of like I mentioned before, the message behind Iron Culture and 3D Muscle Journey is is almost sounds like a dissident opinion. It's it's a it's a counterculture perspective. Um, CrossFit, natural bodybuilding, raw powerlifting, the fact that these are things now, and that they are quote unquote new things should tell you just how far that race to the bottom, as you coined it, went. Raw powerlifting w was just powerlifting. You know, natural bodybuilding was just bodybuilding at the very earliest stage. 
Um, and CrossFit is this idea of this crazy new idea of doing more than like two lifts uh, and doing and having multiple domains of fitness that, you, that you're good at. So it, it almost seems like when you have these narrow specializations and when things get pushed to a limit, they become so narrow uh, and they, that they, they, they create a level of, of distaste in many people and they want to harken back to, all right, we need to you know, wipe the, these records clean and start over. Uh, another example is be anyone who's involved in weightlifting knows that the weight classes in Olympic weightlifting have changed numerous times. And this is almost always because efforts to clean up the sport have been, let's say, less than successful across the board. Um, and this is a really important small tangent, I want to say. Uh, you'll hear this all the time on the internet. Oh, it's professional sport. Or, oh, it's Olympic sport. They're all, they're all on gear. You know, that's what they're doing. It's an arms race. And I think people need to have a little more nuance to that. It varies dramatically country to country, uh, depending on how good internal testing is, uh, how much corruption there is actually in the system, and then what actually happens. So when you make a statement like that, you're doing a disservice to a lot of people, even though it may be true in certain regions, just small aside. But anyway, my point being, the fact that CrossFit has gained such tremendous popularity, the fact that natural bodybuilding has a resurgence in the last 10 years, uh, and the fact that uh, we see a lot of people who are talking about super total training, hybrid training, all that kind of stuff. I think that almost shows that when you push something all the way one direction, you are leaving a certain cultural uh, awareness or desire out in the cold. W would you agree with that, Connor? Yeah, absolutely. And this is not to um, criticize because as I said, I'm a huge fan of professional bodybuilding, strongmen, pretty much anything where people are lifting a weight or have lifted weights at some point in their life. I am a huge fan of it. But you do get this um, feeling, and Omar, you've touched on it as well, where people are disillusioned because they're comparing themselves to Brandon Curry rather than saying, well, okay, I'm not going to look like that, but I can have an overall health and fitness and vitality, which is kind of the tenor of it. And the rise of CrossFit in particular and natural bodybuilding and these things is a kind of pushback against that for the general populace because you know the numbers in the fitness game at that genetic elite level is growing or are growing, but the numbers in the kind of general hoi polloi of people working out and seeking to change their bodies are growing as well. And the problem is the general public is looking to these people not only as inspiration, because they are inspirational, but also as comparison. And that's where we see this disconnect. And again, if we just hark back to, you know, back a hundred years ago when I walked in the snow three miles each way to school, people were focused on overall strength, yes, but also on how their physique looked. But they also wrote about things like meditation, relaxation, good digestion, good sleep, good ventilation. Now, maybe this is overkill, but the physical culturists in the early 1900s were looking at the body in its totality. And we do see that resurgence with things like yoga. A lot more um, fitness individuals speak on the importance of meditation or relaxation. We do have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot on digestion and nutrition these days and vitality through nutrition. So we do see this pushback against the kind of elite professional levels. And this is not to criticize either group, but rather to say that they are actually swimming in different lanes. And I think the fitness industry 100 years ago had a greater appreciation of everyone's different. Some people are going to be wonderful in one thing, but the rest of us can actually you know, succeed in a couple of different metrics at a certain level. And the longer you can stay in the iron game, the better, because if you burn out trying to be the next Iris Kyle or the next Brandon Curry or you know whoever the case may be, that's not going to behoove you in the long run. And the fitness industry in its origins is all about the long run. It is being able to lift, be healthy, be happy across your lifespan. So I think there is definitely a disconnect, which is being slightly recovered or you know being addressed with things like CrossFit, which also emphasizes community, with things like natural bodybuilding, which as Eric, you said, was just bodybuilding a hundred years ago and it's actually it was just bodybuilding until the 1950s and 1960s so it's funny that we now have to create natural bodybuilding you know raw powerlifting this is what arthur saxon and louis sear were doing in the late 1800s early 1900s so we are starting to see corrections emerge in the fitness industry i think for the benefit of the general hoi polloi because the specialists are going to keep you know making our jaws drop with new bigger better stronger faster but it's what the rest of us are doing um 
not maybe not you two guys, but me and me and the other kind of you know troglodytes scrambling to gain muscle. <laughs> what we're doing, um, I think there is more of a more of an attempt to correct things for this side of the fitness industry, for want of a better phrase. Connor, you yeah, you son of a gun. He's you you fit so well into the cult that it's almost like you've been here since we began and, and that that's a whole other discussion because we sold our souls it's it's a it's a long conversation and we're not going to go on that tangent but we just want you to know that we feel comfortable trading your soul with ours so that we don't you know go to Paimon. we'll we'll t- discuss that after but what you just hit on there there's a few there's a few things there and i just want to uh make a comment on one thing in particular before diving off to another topic is that when you said the race to the bottom of the barrel, the race of specificity of trying to excel one particular sport, you actually see that. Like, I was there. I was there. You know, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, where the strength of men failed. <laughs> that quote where I saw the rise of powerlifting on social media, where it kind of was, or uh, let's call it a natural raw powerlifting, where it's kind of powerlifting for all. And so the idea that any individual can do this. And so it, it felt like, it felt almost liberating where this is something, oh, you know, it, it's, it's, as Eric said, being a, a dissident or uh, being here kind of almost an icon- uh, iconoclast where you start something here, you see uh, everyone's talking about looking good. Now I'm going to focus on getting stronger. That's what the industry is telling me. Well, let me make kind of a left turn here. Cool. People try that. But then once again, it becomes part of the greater machine, part of the greater image of what it means to be fitness or what it means to be uh, physical now in the modern era of the last 10 years. So the standards uh, rise, everyone else starts participating. And we're like, oh, w- wait a second. Okay. So like, you know, Getting strong is really good, but there's other things that's very important. Let me try something else. And so we've seen kind of that shift that happens. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to try and find where you fit in, if you want to fit in, if that's indeed one of the things you want to do. And that's why I want to talk about kind of self-authorship. But recently, we I've seen a huge bleed over from uh, pow- in the fitness space, let's say on YouTube and amongst the young whippersnappers, as we say. But there was powerlifting and then there's, of course, a little bit of weightlifting. Weightlifting has some of that complexity associated with it. So not uh, a huge uh, crossover with that. Maybe some uh, strongman competitions. But arm wrestling kind of making a resurgence where the views are in online. Connor, they're insane. Where once again, is that ease of access? Anyway, we're just, hey, we're gripping hands and we're a curling. And also, the assumption of a skill acquisition that might not be there. It's like, well, I, I think I could beat that guy there. And so now I've seen in my personal gym, I've traveled to other gyms where former powerlifters or former fitness enthusiasts from other sectors now trying it out where it's kind of expanding the definition uh, once again of what it means and finding your place. And I'm just curious then to then get to the second part. Uh, part. Uh, Connor, you spoke about how your supervisor said that it's an innate human quality kind of play and also comparison. I'm wondering if you could talk about aesthetics a little bit, looking just beautiful and jacked and maybe whether or not it's the, the innate part is the comparison uh, to others or there's some sort of ideal or uh, that people strive towards or our sense of self-authorship that our image of self, we want it to reflect that which we want to be perceived, the, the thing that we think in our head. What comes together? Because when you reference CrossFit is weird. You said CrossFit, and I did think in my head of oh, the rise of CrossFit, but I remember in 2008 when boxes were taking off, a lot of the discussions were, well, you don't need to do bodybuilding to look good, right? That, that was actually a cornerstone of what got a good portion of people interested. You can get abs without doing traditional bodybuilding movements. Like, you don't have to do curls like we do, you know, whatever, ABC instead. And once again, we had uh, Iron Mind, uh, Eric, what's the name of the uh, dude? Randall Strawson. Randall Strawson, where a lot of his images, and we spoke afterwards, a lot of his best-selling images, even though they're strength athletes, oftentimes they're in very powerful um, aesthetic poses, right? So you have someone moving a lot of weight gracefully, elegantly, and they look once again powerful. So there's a, there's the optical element of it. So it's not just the feet in and of itself, it's the participant in it. And even when we talk once again about powerlifting, natural powerlifting in this uh, day and age, we see those that are referenced a lot and those who just simply put in social media seem to attract and accrue, uh, accrue more of a following. They're kind of a little bit leaner, more muscular, right? So it's not only can this guy lift a lot of weight, but he looks good doing it too, or, or she looks good doing it too, right? So I'm just wondering if you could get into that discussion of the role of looking good in terms of either spreading physical culture or uh in terms of the marketing angle uh, how that took you know playing with people's sense of self like don't you want to look good too or uh, uh who's the guy was it charles atlas like are you tired of getting sand kicked in your face just if you could get a little bit into that conversation of how that's also been intertwined the marketing aspect of it and then the perception of self maybe 
Yes, excellent. So again, I'm going to return briefly to Eugene Sando because he's not the first person to do this. There's an American professor of gymnastics, D.L. Dowd, who does it about a decade before Sando. But Sando emerges, as we said, in 1889. In 1894, he publishes his first book on physical training, where he talks about that you can look like me if you do these exercises, do this training. He'll say the same again when he publishes a book in 1897, <laughs> in 1901, in 1907, in 1914, in 1919, in 1921, etc. He's consistent. Sando, he's consistent. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> if I had that publication record, I'd be a professor. Sando <laughs> sets the stall out for other physical cultures. So he, his first ilk in the early 1900s, the majority of them will sell the idea that you can attain these really lean, muscular, and desirable physiques, you know, six-pack, jacked, really athletic, if you follow their workout programs. One of the few dissidents is Arthur Saxon, who says... I've always been strong. Ever, ever, ever since I've been a kid, I've been stronger than everyone else. I don't know what to tell you. God-given genetics, I don't know. Hit by a lightning bolt, who knows? I'm strong. You're not as strong. These things happen. Sandow and others will create this wonderful cliche or a trope, which is still used in the fitness industry today in various forms, where they will say, I had a very sick and weakly childhood. I was very sick. I was always unwell. It was awful. I was always sick. But then, you know, I picked up these dumbbells, which... You can just buy for nine ninety five, and I develop my physique to the extent that everyone now calls me the world's most perfectly developed specimen. This is the same cliche that Charles Atlas will use in the 1930s, where he'll say, I used to be a weak kid, beat up, you know, they kicked sand in my face. <laughs> I discovered dynamic tension, this workout program that, shit, coincidentally, I happen to sell programs of dynamic tension. I did this program, now I'm strong, muscular, everyone praises my physique. Uh, Earl Lederman were right in the 1920s, Prior to Charles Atlas, you know, women will love your body. You will be virile. He will play on this idea of sexuality and virility in the 1920s. And between people like Sandow, who kind of sets out the style for everyone, Earl Lederman in the 1920s, who's one of the first individuals, and Ben and Jan, uh, Ben Pollock and Jan Todd wrote a wonderful article on this. Le Earl Lederman is one of the first individuals to s explicitly sell sexuality, as in women want a muscular physique. He's one of the first individuals to successfully sell this idea. And then Charles Atlas, who kind of spreads it to the masses. Because depending on how old you are, you can find a comic book somewhere in your house or your parents' house or your grandparents' house that will have a Charles Atlas uh, advertisement in it. So by the 1940s, we have decades of people saying, women want a strong physique. And again, the fitness industry is and was and arguably is predominantly male focused and we can talk about why that is problematic and how that plays out in many different arenas but they're predominantly selling to men saying women want a sexy frame and again it's predominantly heterosexual and again problematic we can talk further on to that but they're saying you too can develop this physique regardless of where you start from and this idea which begins with Sandow and others the poor sickly child in the late 1800s early 1900s who transforms into the world's most perfectly developed specimen this trope arguably doesn't leave the fitness industry and even today if you go on something like instagram you know people aren't saying i was a sickly kid but they're still selling this idea of you too can develop this physique one of the best documentaries in living memory is chris bell's bigger faster stronger i can't remember the fitness model who he speaks to much to my discredit he's one of the most photographed fitness models um in the industry right play. where he says like of, of course so, yeah he's like of course i'm taking steroids I mean, I'm also taking cell tech or whatever the case may be. I don't think it's Greg Plitt. Yeah. No. Um, just, to, just to save your blushes somewhere. <laughs> but, you know, he's saying, well, of course I'm taking steroids, but I'm also taking cell tech. But, and this isn't an endorsement for cell tech, even though it is hardcore and 25 times more powerful than your average creatine. But he's saying, you know, I presume people just understand that I'm genetically blessed and have steroids. We don't. We're dumb because we've been fed a century worth of you too can develop the next physique. So not only are they saying women find this attractive, Again, predominantly male, predominantly heterosexual. You too can do this. But this is now the litmus test because from Sando, who is praised by politicians, physicians, writers, fun fact, the author of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, is a big fan. There's no need for you to know that. It's just a really fun <laughs> fact. But people, when they associate health, fitness, and strength for men, associate it with abs, jacked, lean, muscular. Even though fitness is quite task-specific, this idea of muscularity and leanness as the epitome for men, it's been around because of Greco-Roman culture for centuries, but Sandow really kicks it into overdrive 
So we have all of these aspirational, inspirational, and somewhat shaming messages attached to it. And it becomes the epitome, the trope of masculinity. So I think this is where we get this kind of problematic nature of authorship. And Harrison Pope and others have written about it in a more modern context, where teenagers in particular, and social media has made this a lot worse, they are comparing themselves to Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ronnie Coleman, Irish Kyle, you know, whatever their uh, sport of choice is, Brian Shaw, Thor, you know, whatever your drug or poison is, they're comparing themselves to these people from an early age. And we have this idea that I too can be like that with enough dedication, discipline, willpower, etc. And this is not to say that you will not advance far with these wonderful attributes, but rather that we have very rigid, stand- rigid standards for what male perfection is, for what female perfection is. And they have been around for at least 100 years, if not longer. But more than that, they've been around for at least 100 years, if not longer, with the message that you too can be like this. And when they say like this, they don't mean similar. They mean like this. Sandow's Strength and How to Obtain It, it's available online for free, has a chart of Sandow's body with his measurements. And you can fill in your own measurements so that you can have a body as specific as Sandow's measurements. Charles Atlas will do the same. Many other individuals will do the same. So not only can you have a similar body, you're actually meant to emulate this body. And this is kind of stuck in our psyches in the West for really about 100 years. I think that's so well said. Um, There's so much to cover there and uh, a lot of interesting fun facts. Like Sir Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was also one of the great great competition's judges. Uh, which which is cool. And um, yeah, it goes, like you said, all the way back to the Grecian ideal. And there were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Bernard McFadden would would actually publish in his magazines and writings what the measurements of some of these statues were and said, hey, we should be trying to get to this. And like you said, that's evolved and been, con- well, I shouldn't say evolved, it's been carried through uh, with with a different uh, iconic figure as as the one to to emulate. Uh, I think in more modern times, people know is, according to Steve Reeves, your calves and your biceps are supposed to measure the same amount. Almost every bodybuilder knows that. Um, and Omar, uh, this is why you still got some work to do. I'm a, but, I'm a dissident. Uh, I'm an iconoclast. I'm, I'm battling against the machine. Th- this is my mission, I love Eric. It. Yes. <laughs> you, you're a revolutionary by not training calves. Everyone's so impressed. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it, it's an interesting thing that... Uh, History has given me the perspective that, because I've talked about this many times and I won't go into too much depth, I'm a huge believer in informed consent. Uh, Labeling things as simply bad or good always misses context. Well, not always. I'm sure there's some things that are purely just bad or good. But most of the time, uh, especially when you think about historical or societal context things or or things that, that have multiple reasons that people do it and mean different things to different people, labeling them as just good or bad typically leaves you to only knowing one thing for sure. You're wrong. Um, So I'm a big fan of informed consent, people fully knowing what they're getting into. And I think that uh, the Bigger, Faster, Stronger documentary that you talked about, Connor, uh, there is a different level of fitness literacy in the people who are embedded in the community and the consumers of it. And that's not always acknowledged. Sometimes it's probably willfully pretended to be the case by those to feel more comfortable uh, promoting what they promote. Uh, So I think um, if we are to move forward and if we want to have largely beneficial effects, uh, and this goes into into a little bit of self-authorship like you were talking about, Omar, but doing, doing so from a standpoint of actually understanding what the subtext of what you're writing about yourself is, we have to have informed consent. We have to know... Uh, what it means to be involved in bodybuilding. So, for example, when when I'm coaching athletes, uh, I almost always have the conversation of, hey, look at this like a physical performance feat. I know you're told looking a certain way means certain things about you, and we have, like you said, 100 years of what the male or female ideal, quote-unquote, sh- should or shouldn't be. Uh, but look, you're competing in a sport. Uh, you've got your self-worth. You've got what you look like. That needs to be divorced from what those seven judges say or what that... Uh, the regulations say. And uh, this is, you know, links into social media, this links into everything we're talking about is that to enjoy the benefits of these things and not be victim to the downsides of them, we have to go in with eyes wide open. 
And I think it's much easier to do that, and you're much better equipped to do it if you're aware of the history. Um, there's a reason why you could win the most muscular title uh, from the 60s and earlier, and now that just means you won. You know, there, those are that, that's not a thing. You know, um, so I, I think I think understanding the history of the sports or or just the the non-competitive desires you're 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 following really enables you to see what makes sense and what doesn't, um, because one way to look at like moral rules, you know, people who tend to have more like a rigid mindset of what is good or bad is that those heuristics, which we've talked about in our culture, reflect something that probably made sense at some point in human history. You know, like we think about, you know, like gender roles or strict societal rules that today sound archaic and oppressive. They may have had a functional role at some point in history. Um, they don't today, and they actually probably have a non-functional role. They, they probably cause problems. So we don't want to just always just follow these moral rules. We want to think about, okay, what's the origin of this without necessarily blaming it good or bad and being able to understand, okay, wh what could this lead to for me? And if I don't want that, I need to put my own spin on it. So an example, uh, something that I, I think is you know, a non-black or white view of this. I love uh, that, like you mentioned in like the Arnold Classic, you know, Jan Todd, uh, Bill Kazemeyer, and all the people who are involved who bring in the historical and cultural significance of physical culture into this strongman sport that is absolutely pushing people to the limits. We have um, people who are most likely using copious amounts of anabolic steroids who are training at least very specialized once they are aware of what the specific events are. And sure, strongman has a larger field of implements than something like a powerlifting or a weightlifting. But they also give a great deal of respect to people who came before them. They also are doing things historically, like Martin Lisi's doing a, a world record Steinborn squat. That's not necessary. That, that doesn't need to be in the sport. But the fact that it is, I think, is really important. Because it acknowledges, whether you realize it or not, that there are multiple ways to enjoy physical culture. You can be a competitor who pushes it to the limit and is a specialist and is making some sacrifices about their health, potentially physical and mental, depending on what's your, your poison of choice, like you said, Connor. But you can also say, hey, there are aspects of this that can be done differently. You can put your own flavor on it. This can be beneficial for you. You don't have to do what I'm doing. Uh, you can remove that message and you can be exactly like me too from it. Uh, and you can therefore have more agency and power. So I know there's a long winded uh, little monologue there. But anyway, I just had a lot of a lot of thoughts related to what you said. And I'll leave it there. Brilliant. And I think the point that you've touched on in uh, so many of the podcast um, guests that you have on really touched on the need for nuance in the fitness industry. Because so we'll look at bodybuilding for good or evil. This is kind of my favorite outlet, even though I'm a huge strongman fan and strong woman fan. The first 1901 bodybuilding show is called The Best Developed Man in Great Britain and Ireland. This is created at a time when eugenics is a very big social movement in Great Britain. Eugenics can be positive eugenics. This is the idea of we can improve the health and strength of future generations through school meals or free gym memberships or vaccines, whatever the case may be. We can also have negative eugenics, which is what the United States conducted in the 1920s and 30s Nazi Germany conducted during the Holocaust, where we want to remove, quote unquote, undesirable genetics from the gene pool, whatever the case may be, be it sterilization or something far more dramatic and horrible. But Sandow's competition is created in 1901 at a time when the eugenics movement is kicking off and popular eugenics will link the idea of strong, muscular and elite fr and lean frames to very admirable personality qualities. So, Eric, when you're talking about, you know, people need to divorce themselves from this idea that their self-worth is tied in their body, the history of bodybuilding as a competitive outlet has been born at a time when your physique, for many people, is reminiscent of your personality. So the need for nuance to split it up and say, well, now we're at a stage, hopefully, where positive eugenics just still exists, where we want to improve people through welfare and through kindness. but we can now look at this as just a sport. And I think that's something where you can divorce because you know the history and you know that, Jesus, no, if I have a six pack or not, I can be an asshole. Like, you know I mean? It, do, it doesn't matter, it doesn't discriminate. But the need for nuance is something which history teaches us. And then we can look at where our sport is at the present time. And I think this is something that 
John Todd, Terry Todd, Arnold, Jim Larimer, Bill Cosmar, Dave Webster, John Fair, anyone and everyone who's involved in it, Arnold, does very well because they're paying homage, they're paying respect to the history of the Iron Game when they have something like the Apollon wheels, when they have something like the Louis Sear dumbbell, the Steinborn squat, or the various stone torture implements that they use depending on the year. Because Jan and Terry Todd, they were part of the history, and they are part of the history of the Iron Game. They were very active and strong and achieve uh, at least powerlifters who looked to the past for inspiration and carried that through throughout their careers. So something like the Arnold shows us, not only is this a new creative way of moving the body, like I don't think any strong man would willingly train for a Steinborn squat if not to impress other people, but it also pays homage that where we are now is different to where we were 100 years ago, but what they were doing 100 years ago can inform practices, things to do, but we need to take the good with the bad and not see something as uniformly good or uniformly bad and also realize that when powerlifting emerges, there are very specific things going on. When Olympic weightlifting emerges, there are specific things going on. For example, the introduction of anabolic steroids into Olympic sports comes through the Olympics in the 1950s and 1960s because the United States and the Soviets are trying to outdo each other on the weightlifting platform. So it's important to have these nuances because I think it can inform and help us remove away some of the BS and just see things just as a sport which can pay homage or homage to what's gone on before it, but also knows that we're in a different socio-cultural, political situation than our forefathers and foremothers. I think it's this need for nuance, which the history is so important, because then we can start to see, well, what do I want, rather than mindlessly kind of following what's gone on before me? Because what's gone on before me is born from a time that is radically different to where we are now. And this idea of informed consent, if you just go along with the fitness industry, specifically kind of general fitness industry, they are still peddling the selling of fitness and selling very specific and successful messages that aren't really different from 120 years ago. They'll play on the idea to be a quote-unquote real man, whatever the case may be. They'll play on the idea of the ideal female frame, which is rooted in a lot of different prejudices and problems. So if you're not informed and have a history of the knowledge or have a knowledge of what's going on in the present moment, you will get swept up in things which more than likely can lead to disillusionment with whatever your sport may be, because you're no longer in charge of your own decisions, but you're also dealing with like 120 years of crap that's mainly marketing and selling and like at times slightly racist scientific policies like negative eugenics. So the need for informed and uh, consent and nuance is something that's really important and therein lies the value of kind of history for the general iron head wherever they are in the world. I think that's so well said, and uh, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, Omar, one thing I was thinking as he was talking about uh, the historical implements in the Arnold uh, was the use of uh, Conan's wheel, uh, the Wheel of Pain, which mm-hmm. is, as we know from the uh, the great history documentary starring Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. uh, about the uh, the real life uh, Conan the Barbarian, uh, who was present, uh, you know, at that wherever that location and time was. Uh, nonetheless. Um, I think I think that's really well said, and I think that that almost perfectly encapsulates uh, the reason why history is so important, how it ties into culture, and how you can understand where we are today. One thing I want to do, I want to ask you, Omar, is we have these guests on, these wonderful guests and historians that we've had, um, and you hear them talk about the way things were. How often do you just feel like things repeat themselves as, as someone who is, is on YouTube? Eric, 100%. You know, it's, uh, I think this episode is one of those instances that if we removed the eras and you said, yeah, Eugene Sandow from, you know, 2011, he uh, posted this, this is the thing that he would, uh, he did, it would be entirely relevant to the conversation today, kind of the cycles that you see. Um, and so I, th- I think that actually should give one courage and hope almost when you see that once again that these are pattern if you can recognize the patterns you can almost try and avoid them or just understand some of the games being played rather than feeling once again that you're enveloped this this is something that's just happening to me right that i have uh no willpower of my own i have uh, no decisions i can make or I, I have no understanding what's going on you look at the past and you see how things have happened or how they've transpired and it kind of gives you it arms you with the greater sense of both maybe internal purpose of that which you don't want so you see What's happening to you? You almost can remove yourself for uh, uh, and get a perspective, but no, uh, Eric. I've so 
was so funny. I've been now part of the industry, as you have, for over a decade. And I've seen cycles happen within that decade. So you see the smaller cycles, then the larger cycles, and then the resurgence of certain things where once again, um, it being intertwined with other, th so uh, self-image, uh, the idea that consuming goods or material goods or it items, some sort of material item will satisfy that which you don't have, right? So the the new uh, armaments that are being sold, the new uh, fancy uh, gadgets, the things that you're being uh, told. And I, it, it was funny, I'm not going to name, uh, there's many people that do this, but when you're saying, Connor, like being sold in the image or the idea that you want to be virile or like you want to be a, a young, uh, sexual, healthy male, I can't help but feel the advertisements that you see, and it's quite common, where, so they're not, I'm not, I'm not saying this, I'm just asking questions, bro. So they won't, they won't say it directly. They will not say directly that you'll get the girl, but the advertisement, and there's an advertisement that's gotten millions of views. And once again, because it's playing on the inner psyche, the insecurity maybe of young men, and they know this, that the, these are things that obviously uh, that happen, so they could prey upon it, where you have the girl, you have the mansion. You have the workout. Well, the workout plan comes at the end, but you're the hot hunk that has the girl, uh, that has the car, that has the luxurious lifestyle, that maybe has the gym, and it's all thanks to the program that made all of these things possible. Now, that's the subtext. It's not saying it overtly to your face, but your interpretation when you see it, they're focusing when they show it. It's all marketing. It's uh, you know a, a fancy trailer. They're showing this physique, and man, it really seems like the physique is what's allowing them to acquire these material and look how much happier he is. And I just want to say, and I won't uh, give the context for this, but uh, out of curiosity, uh, Connor, are you aware of the book called Might is Right? No, no, what's this? So I'm not I'm not even going to get into it, but it, when you uh, spoke about negative eugenics or the idea of supremacy, um, someone showed me that this is uh, a few years ago, but once again, it, it's, it's the connection between, uh, you know, trying to be an alpha male, uh, a physicality, uh, the superiority of uh, certain individuals. And so it's creating this narrative of, you know, almost manifest destiny, the will to power that I, that there's a certain subset of people that should be ruling. And so once again, all these things come together and you see often, unfortunately, in uh, various places, how that could be um, alluring for certain individuals. So now seeing it, Eric, now reading the history, my boy, E. Helms, you should check him out where we got together and then you told me, uh, so I have Muscle Smoke and, and Mirrors Randy Roach. And then the other one, I don't think I have Muscle Town USA. What's the one, uh, the making of uh, Mr. America? What's that one called, uh, Eric? Yep. So um, yeah. John Farrah, Mr. America. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and I think I think really, even if you're not a fan of history and you're just like, man, dog, I just want to get jacked. Like, I just sick to lift a lot of weight and whatnot. It gives you a greater understanding, even your why, right? of uh, why we do these things so no man i've uh, i've seen the cycles and i'm aware of it and let me just say i look forward to continuing within it for the rest of eternity because we sold our souls so that's that that is the contractual obligation absolutely uh we're we're, we're paying off our souls <laughs> credit card with other souls credit cards uh nothing wrong with that folks and uh and eventually we'll figure out who actually owns the souls of myself and omar but until then we're riding high soulless and jacked uh, moving forward, you know, Connor, one thing I did want to ask you, cause, uh, you mentioned, actually, I think this is off air. You mentioned this. So hopefully I'm not, uh, not telling any stories you don't want out there, but you have donned the speedo competed in natural bodybuilding. I wonder how much has your experience as a historian informed your choices to compete, uh, the meaning you make of competition and how you managed the, that, that journey and that experience. So unfortunately, as a historian, I want to forget my time in the Speedo, but I'm, I really can't uh, in so many different ways. I think it's funny what both of you have been talking about. My first time stepping on stage, and I will preface this with, I've never gotten on the podium. I finished fourth in my second show, and that's a huge achievement for me. But the first time I stepped on stage was for all of the wrong reasons. It was, I thought this was going to bring me happiness because I was 20 when I stepped on stage. You know, I thought this was the ideal physique. I'm an FFB former fat boy so i wear that title with pride so i thought that the lean muscular you know abs this was going to be the game changer for me get on stage i did not place very highly completely destroyed uh my hormonal system so i was overeating and it was delightful for several weeks after the show did everything wrong and did it for the wrong reasons 
kind of step back, took a few years. This is when I started to study the history of physical culture. I went into the second show. I'm not comparing myself to, believe it or not, Ronnie Coleman and Frank Zane, two of my inspirations, because, again, family just about survived the Irish famine in the 1840s. So I'm not, I'm not blessed genetically in many different ways. But, you know, so now I'm going at it from, this is kind of Eric, as you said, this is a, a sporting contest for me now. Where I place in it, that is just a nature of sport. I can't control who's going there. But I'm not now placing my value as a human being on being jacked, ripped, lean, etc. So I ended up doing a lot better, mainly because I was a lot more relaxed going into, as relaxed as someone can be when they are starving themselves uh, on purpose. And, you know, I did better, managed to come out of it better because so much of my self-worth wasn't wrapped up in it because the first time I went in was from a kind of modern approach, right? Where I'm looking at Muslim Fitness and Flex Magazine when you could still buy those easily rather than going online. You know, I'm comparing myself to people on the really crappily pixelated bodybuilding.com forums. I'm taking all the supplements. This is going to be my gateway, my, my ticket to success, like Omar, you're saying. First, first the abs, then the big house, then all the money, then the tiger and the Lamborghini. Um, I'm not sure why you'd want to put a tiger in a Lamborghini, but I mean, no one would ever steal their car from you, so there is that. The second time I'm going in, this is a sporting endeavor. I understand that I'm not doing this. It's not who I am because I now have a knowledge of that this is a message that's a really successful marketing message. So the messages for men in the fitness industry are created in the 1880s, 1890s. You'll get the girl, you'll get the job, stellar personality, all of your dreams will come true. That's actually a really successful uh, package, which the fitness industry hasn't really deviated from. We now have things say, get strong, get jacked, alpha male, but it's still basically the same message. You remove abs for like a 600 pound deadlift and the messages are kind of the same. So I think having a knowledge of the marketing package, which has been so successful over the last century and a half, kind of helped me in my very lame bodybuilding uh, efforts because it's no longer who I am, right? It's a sporting endeavor that I'm going to do. And actually, if I had listened to the people in Herc's gym when I was training, wonderful natural bodybuilder Mick Hurricane who I've never seen someone consistently lean year round he trained like the world was ending but he always said to me that this was his sport not who he was obviously I'm a dumb kid in my teens and 20s so you know I'm not going to listen to him right what does he know but I kind of got round to that when I'm training like 27 28 when I went on the platform again and I, I was able to divorce who I am with what I do and I think a lot of that came from natural maturity but then also being very cynical and aware of how the fitness industry has packaged and sold this message through the decades because we get cycles of different things be it a shake weight or the late you know a, what's the velocity diet or you know whatever is going to be the next big break but the messages attached to it is pretty much the same we're just changing the shiny object at the end so even just having a knowledge of that in my own chosen sport um kind of helped me i suppose in my very meager competitive uh, sphere and don't try and find photos of me online because I've scrubbed the internet <laughs> of me and a speedo. They're on my phone for when I'm feeling low. <laughs> Nowhere else online. I will put that out there right now. But yeah, having a knowledge of the history I think really helped me separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of what I wanted. And again, Eric was saying informed consent, what I wanted to get from what I do and how I do it in the gym. I love it. You've you've looked backwards to get a better understanding of how to move forward. And we combine that with Omar's experience saying, hey, me being on YouTube, what I see, what I've experienced might as well have been people if you transported YouTube back 60, 160 years. Not that different. Uh, so I think that that's a that's a really good. I'm not going to say it's the end because I do want to open the floor to the expert. I think that's a really nice uh, kind of cherry on top to everything that, that, that's been in this wonderful episode to so people can understand the relevance of history. Uh, the last thing I, I do I do want to do before we also ask uh, you, to, you to share more where people can find about what you're doing. I know you've got a book that has uh, come out on Irish physical culture pretty soon that we'll talk about. Um, but I want to open the floor to the expert. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We've jumped around in our very nonlinear uh, iron culture-esque way we do things here. Uh, is there th anything in the, the history of physical culture and its transition to sport that you think uh, we would be remiss in not discussing, Connor? I mean, there's a couple of different uh, 
I suppose alleys we could go down. The one thing I would say is take me down a dark alley, Connor. That's what I want but you, from but just every Irishman I've ever what, met. What you do there will separate you from your contemporary predecessor. Yeah, your 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 prior countryman. Uh, uh, yeah. countryman. Yes. Um, I will not incriminate myself <laughs> with such baseless accusations, but one of the very well lit and perfectly safe and all above board alleys that we could <laughs> go down is just to remind people that everything we do in the gym is constructed so from the way we squat bench and deadlift people didn't do that 100 years ago people came together men and women created a form for every exercise that you do in the gym people have sat around experimented and trialed every diet they have tried every piece of equipment the barbell did not drop like manna from heaven there is a 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 year period where people are experimenting with the barbell or the dumbbell much like omar and his conspiracy theories question everything because people have come together agreed upon and created everything we do from the exercises to how we do them to the messages that we attach to them so that's one very well lit alleyway that it would go down the second thing i would just say is for people who want to know more go on to iron game history and the journal that's created by the members of the stack center and its affiliates because you will see anything from weightlifting to powerlifting to bodybuilding and everything in between. The last well-lit alleyway, I would say, <laughs> is that it is so wonderful to be on this podcast, to be chatting to people who appreciate that fitness should, could, and will be for each demographic. Because so much of the fitness industry, as we've touched upon, has been predominantly focused on the white muscular physique. I am not descending onto social justice territory. I am not getting on my soapbox. But so much of what has been built around in the fitness industry has built on very narrow confines of the white male physique. And if you think that this isn't problematic, think of the disappearance of the Miss Olympia competition for several years in the kind of 2010s, which is now coming back. We have historical messages and ideas of what fitness should be and who it should be for, which can at times hold back people in the modern age. So question everything. Always go down a well-lit alley with Eric because you don't know what he's capable of. And if you want more information, there is, you know, Iron Game History, the Rogue Fitness documentaries, books like Randy Roach's Muscle Smoker Mirrors, Dave Chapman's Sand of the Magnificent, John Fair's written a huge amount. There is a huge amount of history out there. And to reiterate the Charles Pollock quote, if you want to learn something new, read a book from 50 years ago. Dan John, who's kind of my bae when it comes to fitness writing, has a story about, you know, he is still digesting a paragraph on isometric training from the 1950s, which he returns to sporadically. And this one paragraph, he learns something new from it each time. So this is not to say that all the answers are in the past, but we can learn a lot and inform the future based on what people have done. Uh, damn it, I went on my soapbox, but not to, I, I didn't get all the way. I had one foot oh. on the soapbox, one foot in reality. I think I was balanced so it quite well. Then. I don't know if we're both going to fit on it because I'm going to step up, up there right with you. Uh, and we will, we will hug each other on this soapbox right now. Uh, breaking what we are supposed to be as ideal males, uh, hugging on a soapbox together. But I will confidently change the game with you, my friend. Um, I think you, you brought up some really amazing things. So first, your point about movements being constructed. Uh, huge shout out to Chip Conrad. This is something he's been talking about a lot uh, he has been, I would say, a modern physical culturalist, uh, and he has promoted the idea of, hey, this is about play and movement, and there's many ways you can do it. Uh, this is also echoed by modern theory in physical therapy, that we are not, uh, you know, we don't need to be flexion phobic, in, in, like everything causes injury type of people. We are resilient, and building resilience and empowering people is what fitness should be, regardless of who those people are. So I love both of those messages. I also like that you brought up Charles Poliquin again, because this is a great hearkening back to what we said earlier about how, you know, there's complexity in history because history is full of people, damn it. And Charles Poliquin, we love to hate in the evidence-based community because of many of his baseless claims and many of his marketing stuff. But we cannot forget that he was also the first person in 1988 in the pre or the proto JSCR Journal of Strength Conditioning Research, the NSCA journal back in the day, who introduced the concept of undulating periodization. So, shout out to Mike Zerdos, you're a direct descendant of Charles Poliquin, whether you like it or not. Uh, so, you know, no, no person is a monolith. 
Uh, no person is defined by only one fact. And finally, the fact that you brought up Dan John, uh, this is a fantastic example of how someone who is an older generation, I don't want to be just disrespectful and say, oh, that's old guy, but we had him on and he is dropping knowledge about coaching, about programming, about his history, uh, about his history as a coach and as an athlete that I have probably learned just as much as from him as I have from the rest of the entire industry and, and the wisdom he has. So I'm right there with you, fanboying. I think you've uh, you've left us with some really good messages, Connor. Um, Omar, anything you want to add before we ask this gentleman where he can be found and what books he's adding to the great uh, library of physical culture uh, so we can learn more about how to survive a potato famine? And that's when Connor once again stands up and says, we're surrounded by water. <laughs> <laughs> no one thought of fishing. I'm like, whoa, Connor. Hey, hey. Uh, no, I just I want to echo what Eric said. It doing this episode, honestly, uh, Connor man, has made me realize how much I missed doing uh, the historical episodes, but also with the cultural context that's very relevant. And I think this episode, when we were before trying to bring people up to speed, okay, here is the history of the 1700s, 1800s, the 1900s, and so on and so forth. We you really managed to tie things together, and so give a greater once again understanding. I'm just really happy. That's it. That's all I want to say. I just want to thank you, honestly, uh, for being on. This turned out better. Not that I wasn't expecting it to go well, but it once again reminded me, historically speaking, way back in the day, our episode. So you'd have to go at least 70 weeks back to listen to the last one. So it, it's it's way back. Yeah, I know. Well, this is me showing the nerd in me. I was walking to a conference in Chester, listening to you guys speak to Dom and Ben um when the episode first came out so i'm thinking god it'd be cool to go on this podcast so as i said i have hidden my fangirling so poorly but at times hidden it okay yeah. um, so this really is a great honor so honestly thank you guys so much um for the opportunity our true pleasure and uh, and connor where can people follow uh either your work as an academic or or anything that that you think would be of, of value to the cult I know you've got, like I said, you've, you've got you've got a book that's newly out. Tell us about it. Where can people find you? Brilliant. So, unfortunately, it's not How to Survive a Potato Famine 101. I'm a huge Max Brooks fan who obviously is World War Z and Devolution. My forays into literature or fiction will be a potato famine dystopian future. So I'm saving all of my knowledge <laughs> on how to survive that um, for the book that eventually comes out, a Stephen King, Max Brooks sort of yeah. crossover. I, I The potato stand. The potato stand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people aren't going to want to talk to me when I go back to Ireland. <laughs> um, I, do, I do have an academic book, which actually will be out in February 2021 with um, Palgrave Macmillan. It's very inventively called The History of Physical Culture in Ireland. So it looks at the development of health and body cultures in Ireland from the late 1800s to the early 1900s or to the 1930s, 40s. Effectively talking about everything that you... Eric, Omar, and I have been talking about, but within an Irish context. And it kind of is going to be part of a, a body of literature that joins greats like Joanne Tumblety, who's written on physical culture in France, Ina Zweiniger Bauslowska, who's written on it in England, uh, Michael Budd, who's written on it in, in England, others who have written on it in Germany, Simon Creek in Laos, and many others Jan Todd, Terry Todd, Dave Webster, Dave Chapman, Dave Waller. Oh, I won't give you the full bibliographic list, but effectively, I'm looking at, you know, how did physical culture and gym cultures come to Ireland? Because again, everything is constructed, right? It didn't drop from, from heaven. How did it come to Ireland? What did it mean when it came to Ireland? Ireland wins independence from Great Britain in 1921. Uh, so how did physical culture become politicized? Because the Irish Republican Army in the early 1920s asks physical culturists, can you train troops so that we can beat the British? And there's a wonderful quote from someone who links his interest in physical culture to throwing grenades at British soldiers. Obviously, I'm sure you guys will echo, we discourage anyone from throwing grenades in 2020, but how awesome would it be if you could link your bicep curls to blowing things up? Just saying. So I have the academic book on the history of physical culture in Ireland, which is coming out in 2021. You can also find me, I have my own very unimaginatively titled <laughs> website, physicalculturestudy.com. <laughs> You can tell I studied history and not marketing or business or advertising because the best name I could think of when I started the site six years ago was physicalculturestudy.com. That is the unsexiest title, but there's about a thousand articles on various aspects of the history of fitness and the fitness industry. I also contribute regularly to barband.com, which I think 
Eric, that's how you reached out, and I'm very thankful mm -hmm. to David uh, Tao and everyone else for facilitating that link. And then I'm also on Twitter, again, unimaginatively, Fizz C Study uh, is my Twitter handle, P H Y S capital C S T U D Y. I need to work on my marketing, I will admit. But if you want random fun facts from the fitness industry, you can go on Barbend, you can go on Physical Culture Study, you can go on the Stack Center website, which has digitized um, Iron Game history, but also digitized scrapbooks and digitized old magazines from the 1900s, where I will also contribute sporadically articles to the Stack Center website. So I'm all over the internet, except for the photos of me in a Speedo. And good luck finding them, folks. And also, please don't find them. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, but don't try. Uh, hey, I'll stop you there. Just don't try. Just don't try. Got it. Uh, Dr. Heffernan, I'm going to give you your honorific back at the end of the episode. I just want to say thank you so much for being on this episode. I think you dropped some uh, incredible knowledge, uh, some very interesting information. Uh, but more importantly, I think you gave people a lot of perspective that I hope will positively influence not only their own journey, but hopefully those that they come in contact with, because there's a lot of trainers and promoters of information who do listen. Uh, and we'll link all of that in the show notes. Uh, and I'm going to stop right here because I'm almost closing this episode out. I'm almost taking my man's Omar's uh, you know, stage. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to lateral this sucker right over to you, my friend, and let you close us out all the way. <sighs> what a monster episode. I was going to make a Spinal Tap joke about too much perspective, but I'll just go right forward and uh, echo basically what Connor said in terms of not trying to find those photos. Look, you made it all the way to the end of this episode. We appreciate everyone. We'll link the social media of Connor in the description. We appreciate everyone listening. If you want to leave a rating and a review on iTunes, go ahead. But once again, as Connor said, if it's not five stars, don't even bother. Don't, don't try. Just, hey, sit that one back. We, under we, we could sense what you're sensing. On YouTube, the comments are getting lit. We're getting, Eric, now 20, 30 comments if you're on there. There's some people that you listen on, uh, what is it? They listen on Spotify or maybe iTunes. Very soon, myself and uh, Eric have been talking, we might try and create some sort of space where the Iron Culture enthusiasts can get together and just communicate. But that's the best place to communicate directly with us. We appreciate everyone. We're back every single Monday from now until we figure out where our souls go, like who we owe them to physically and how we could trade that off to someone else so that we don't actually have to give up our everlasting souls and we could just continue doing this forever. <laughs>